let me in introduce to you uh, the dean of the law school, Dean Partlett. Uh, dean Partlett, as you will soon learn, is uh, a wonderful leader of our law school. He has been very encouraging uh, of our center here in international comparative law. And uh, the dean has uh, graciously uh, uh, given us his presence to give us some remarks to start us off. Dean Partlett. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, let me lead with an apology, too. I would have loved to have sat down and uh, had lunch with you and uh, attend some of the session, but I've been called away this afternoon, uh, so I must uh, speak and then run. But I did want to put, a uh, put aside just a moment uh, to welcome you to uh, Emory University Law School. It's a great honor and privilege to have uh, so many scholars and policy makers here uh, today. I should always want to recognize a fellow dean, and uh, D Dean Lozano is here from the Universitat Panamericana. And uh, Dean, it's, uh, it's great to have you uh, here with us. Uh, we've got um, uh, uh, Mr. Gonzalez de la Vega from the Attorney General's uh, department in, in Mexico and I have a wonderful bundle of books here and as uh, my, my colleague Paul Swear says we'll have to brush up on our Spanish in order to, to read these but this will be an education for me. It's a, um, as I said, it's, it's a great privilege. I thank USAID and HED Higher Education for, for Development for the funding for this conference and indeed for leading the way uh, to enable uh, Professor Swear's uh, Center for Advocacy uh, to play such an important role in uh, developing uh, a center for advocacy in uh, the uh, University of Pan Panamericana. And um, it's a, uh, it is a great uh, privilege. I was looking at The Economist magazine just a week or so back, and I don't know how many of you saw that. I was looking for it today. I couldn't find it. I want to flash it up here. To, it, it showed a map of South America uh, and Central America uh, upside down. And it's a perspective because I'm uh, uh, an Australian, so I'm used to this upside down look at the world. Uh, and uh, so often, I think, uh, from North America, uh, you tend to think of things down as being different. And we ought to think that there's a reorientation in the world, as it is. And uh, the burden of the Economist uh, magazine articles that were there was an article about uh, South America, Central America rising, the idea that things are reorienting and that uh, all of us are on the same continent and all of us need to attend to all of the issues and problems that are there and that's why it's a special source of pride for me to uh, to to be here at Emory Dean at Emory when Emory is doing such valuable work I think with you and that you can at the same time help us understand these issues and very much at the core, very much at, uh, I think, a, uh, a threat to civil society and therefore to rule of law is the violence which is generated by the uh, illicit drug trade. Uh, and I know that uh, at this conference uh, you will be addressing uh, this topic very closely and I'm confident that uh, this will lead to a greater understanding of uh, the nature of this. At least, I think, in United States policy nowadays, there is a more openness to admit that this is a general issue which is going to affect the United States as it's going to affect uh, Mexico and other countries on the continent. And it's a question that we've all got to start uh, working on. To, to have a look at what the nature of the problem is and then to develop some uh, beginnings of solutions to this issue. And so I wish you all the best as uh, you convene informal sessions 
and I wish you all the best as you convene in more informal sessions to, to enjoy the hospitality which uh, I hope that, uh, that we will give. So great conferencing and I wish you all the best and thank you for being here. It's a great privilege. Alex, did you want to say a few words? My colleague, uh, Alex Barney. Alex. Thank you very much, Dean Partlett. For those of you who need uh, translations, I'm going to do this in Spanish. So if you want to put on your headsets. Eh, señores conferencistas, señores invitados, estimados colegas. En nombre de las universidades Panamericana y Emory, sean bienvenidos a Atlanta. Es un honor tenerlos aquí. Mi nombre es Alejandro Barney y soy un investigador en la Escuela de Derecho de la Universidad eh, Emory. Durante los últimos tres años, he tenido la suerte de trabajar con el profesor Paul Swear. Profesor Paul Swear es un experto en varios campos, incluyendo el de técnicas para juicios orales, que ha estado enseñando en los Estados Unidos desde los años 80. Por los últimos 25 años, ha viajado a otros países para enseñarles las técnicas a abogados extranjeros. Esta conferencia nace de una alianza entre las escuelas de derecho de las universidades Emory y Panamericana. Hace dos años, la organización Higher Education for Development, que forma parte del Consejo Americano de Educación, pidió propuestas para formar alianzas entre escuelas de derecho de universidades de Estados Unidos y de México con motivo de la reforma constitucional en materia penal que se aprobó en junio de 2008 y que requiere la implementación de un sistema de juicios orales en todo el país a más tardar en 2016. Con la ayuda del ilustre y nacional Colegio de Abogados de México, Paul y yo pudimos buscar y desarrollar una alianza con la Universidad Panamericana, una de las escuelas de derecho más prestigiadas de México. Nuestra alianza ha estado, ha estado trabajando desde el año pasado, cuando impartimos un curso de Derecho Penal Comparado en la Universidad Panamericana. Desde entonces, hemos logrado la creación de un instituto para la enseñanza de técnicas para juicios orales y hemos impartido también dos cursos intensivos para abogados mexicanos. Esta conferencia es una adición a nuestro proyecto original, dado que nuestros fondos provienen del Plan Mérida, creímos que era importante explorar posibilidades de esfuerzos como el nuestro para fortalecer el Estado de Derecho y políticas públicas que pueden ser eficaces a pesar del nivel de violencia que ha resultado de la lucha en contra del narcotráfico. También nos interesaba la oportunidad para trabajar con otras alianzas patrocinadas por Higher Education for Development y USAID. Seis de estas alianzas están representadas en esta conferencia. Agradecemos la presencia de todos ustedes en Atlanta. Quisiera mencionar especialmente a personas e instituciones sin cuya ayuda no hubiéramos podido organizar este evento. Higher Education for Development, USAID, y especialmente el señor Manny Sánchez y la señorita Gema Jiménez. Nuestras escuelas, las universidades Emory Panamericana, Aldin David Partlett, el doctor José Antonio Lozano, la señora Anita Mann y el, um, el doctor Juan Abelardo, Juan Abelardo Hernández Franco. Al Ilustre Nacional Colegio de Abogados de México y especialmente a su vicepresidente, el doctor Julio Hernández Pliego. Al Instituto para Naciones en Desarrollo y especialmente a la doctora Cita Rancho Nilsson y a la señora Mary Ward sin cuya intervención muchos de los aquí presentes no hubieran podido acompañarnos en Atlanta. Finalmente, agradecemos el apoyo a la alianza entre la Universidad de San Diego y la Universidad Autónoma de Baja California, y especialmente al profesor Allen Schneider. Ahora tengo el agrado de ceder el uso de la palabra al doctor José Antonio Lozano. Muchas gracias, Alex por el uso de la palabra. A todos ustedes, antes que nada, como representante, como dean de la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad Panamericana, tengo que agradecer de manera muy especial, muy específica, a Paul, Paul Svir, 
la invitación que muy amablemente nos hizo para colaborar en un proyecto de esta naturaleza. Igualmente, el agradecimiento institucional a USAID, a HD, por toda la colaboración y sobre todo por la idea generadora de todo esto, todo lo que estamos haciendo. Quisiera aquí pues no hacer mayores comentarios porque me parece que Alejandro ya ha hecho una explicación larga del origen de esta alianza. Quisiera tomar durante unos breves minutos el uso de la palabra para comentar, si me lo permiten, por qué la Universidad Panamericana ha encontrado en esta alianza con la Universidad de Emory un mecanismo de trabajo en una línea de investigación que nos ha interesado desde hace muchos años. Quisiera también explicar de manera más o menos clara qué pretendemos en conjunto con la Universidad de Emory como fruto del esfuerzo de este Congreso y de lo que se ha hecho hasta el momento, en palabras de Alejandro. Sin duda alguna, nosotros somos hijos, y me refiero a toda América, y especialmente, muy especialmente América Latina, de la Revolución Francesa. Históricamente, la Revolución Francesa significó, en el tiempo exacto de nuestras independencias, el modelo jurídico, el modelo político a seguir. Y el modelo obtenido de ese momento histórico, fue un modelo basado fundamentalmente en la revolución constitucional y en la codificación del derecho. La codificación del derecho que impacta en América Latina de una manera totalmente distinta, totalmente diferente a lo que ocurrió en los países que siguieron la tradición del derecho anglosajón. Ese modelo, el de la codificación en los países latinos, significó entre otras cosas un modelo monolítico, estructural de la sociedad, significó un solo generador del derecho, supuso, entre otras cosas, que el Estado, que el gobierno, se hacía cargo de todos los procesos jurídicos y legales. Eso, que por un lado se entendía muy bien en la época, también supuso que las leyes adquirieron un modelo de interpretación bastante estricto, cerrado, en el que la argumentación, en el que el discurso prácticamente desapareció. Nos volvimos prácticamente, si se pudiera y si se me permite, unos repetidores de la ley y del código. Eso responde a un momento histórico y desde luego y sin duda en el momento histórico en que ocurrió, ayudó y tuvo beneficios en la consolidación de las naciones de esta última época de la historia. Pero también es verdad que la historia en los últimos tiempos nos ha venido rebasando, y nos ha rebasado a través de muchos mecanismos, uno de ellos la globalización, que claramente a todas luces ha afectado el conjunto de los países. También, sin duda alguna, en este nuevo modelo, cada vez las mayores necesidades que existen en la sociedad civil han venido rebasando las posibilidades que tiene el Estado para poder responder en toda América Latina a esas necesidades de justicia, de igualdad económica y de igualdad en otros aspectos. Es por ello que creo y creemos y lo hemos venido sosteniendo en una línea de investigación en la Universidad Panamericana desde hace años, que la sociedad, que el mundo, que nuestros países en América Latina, que específicamente en el caso de México, requerimos volver a repensar el modelo en su conjunto. Ese modelo monolítico, ese modelo monoestructural, volverlo nuevamente, como lo fue históricamente, tampoco es que descubramos nada nuevo bajo el sol, un modelo policéntrico, un modelo en el que el derecho se vuelva más dúctil a la interpretación, más dúctil a la argumentación. De hecho, tenemos que reconocer que estamos en un momento de transición histórica para regresar nuevamente a ese tipo de modelos estructurales sociales y modelos jurídicos. La tradición latina, en ese sentido, empieza cada vez a encontrar más comunes denominadores 
con la tradición anglosajona, tradición que no pasó por este tamiz de la historia tan rígido, tan estricto que fue el de la codificación del derecho. Es por ello también que la experiencia que en litigación específicamente, que es una de las argumentativas más relevantes del sistema jurídico, el ejemplo que nos pueden dar es bien tomado, bien concebido y sobre todo, sumado a los esfuerzos, supone muchos años de experiencia que perdimos en la historia y que retomamos actualmente. Por ello, no me parece simplemente que lo que hemos hecho y el esfuerzo actual sea sentarnos aquí por un tema de una reforma constitucional que pudiera añadirse como una reforma más, como algo que en México ocurre, como han pasado tantas otras reformas legislativas en materias de telecomunicaciones o posiblemente en, en materias que tienen que ver con vías generales de comunicación o inclusive en materia fiscal. Me parece que esto tiene mucho más fondo porque toca las fibras más sensibles del sistema jurídico, en las que está escrita, en las que está basada la verdadera justicia, la justicia de esos denominados en castellano justiciables que requieren ahora nuevos argumentos, un sistema que requiere nuevas vías, nuevo oxígeno. Me parece que este es una de las primeras señales de un cambio transicional histórico, no solo en México, sino en América Latina. Por eso, en la Universidad Panamericana consideramos que esto nos hace partícipes del cambio histórico. Y también por ello, esta línea de investigación no podía, no debía quedarse estrictamente en un proyecto pasajero, que terminara con esto, con un evento académico del que pudiera surgir alguna publicación, algunas conclusiones. De lo que se trataba y de lo que se trata es de fundar algún instituto que pueda dar continuidad precisamente a esta idea y que continúe por los caminos de profundización en esta línea de pensamiento que nos parece de la mayor trascendencia. Y por ello precisamente es que el producto de todo lo que hemos hecho aquí es la fundación de un instituto de alta litigación que pensamos lanzar a la luz pública en el próximo mes de febrero, es, insisto, producto de esto, a lo que le debemos desde luego todo nuestro agradecimiento a Paul, el trabajo tan intenso que Alex ha estado haciendo en México, o no, se han entregado a este trabajo para formar a las nuevas generaciones de abogados con esta nueva cultura del derecho. No puedo mencionar a todos los abogados que bajo la acertada dirección del licenciado Carlos Requena en este momento conforman el instituto, porque podría, por falta de memoria, cometer alguna injusticia con alguno de ellos. Pero sí decirles que precisamente esa es la parte más clara, más profunda y sobre todo más evidente del esfuerzo que estamos haciendo. Espero que nuestra próxima de muchas intervenciones académicas y congresos que podamos organizar sea en el seno ya de este nuevo instituto y que el instituto pueda convocar a discusiones como la que hoy nos trae aquí Atlanta. A todos ustedes, la mayor de mis gratitudes y espero que todos juntos podamos conformar un nuevo momento del sistema jurídico internacional. Muchísimas gracias. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Salvador de Lara, soy el cónsul general de México aquí en Atlanta. Eh, me da mucho gusto participar hoy en el inicio de esta conferencia, que además arrojará pronto frutos muy concretos como el desarrollo de este instituto. Eh, y quisiera, en atención a nuestros anfitriones, eh, alejarme del protocolo para hacer mi intervención en inglés. I want to start off by, or, by thanking Emory and all organizing and supporting institutions for inviting me here today. Since 2006, the government of Mexico has put security at the top of its national and bilateral agenda. The two cornerstones in the efforts to improve security have been the battle against organized crime and the strengthening of the rule of law. That is why I believe that this conference, by focusing on both issues and how they relate, is of the uttermost relevance. 
the government of Mexico has undertaken a series of important steps in order to strengthen the rule of law and security. There has been an increased presence of law enforcement in the country, as well as a constant professionalization, training, and equipping of the public officials who work at the main justice and law enforcement agencies. An important judicial reform has been enacted that will enable the criminal justice system to be more efficient and effective. Although it is true that this head-on confrontation has increased the violence in certain geographical areas of Mexico, specifically the border states, there has also been a world record number of seizures of narcotics, cash, and weapons. Also, Mexico has apprehended some of the most notorious crime bosses and has extradited an unprecedented amount of them to the United States. Drug trafficking, by its very nature, is an international phenomenon that can only be fought successfully through the bilateral cooperation between the United States and Mexico. That is why the government of Mexico presented the, US, the United States with the necessity to adopt a common strategy based on the principles of shared responsibility in order to combat organized crime. From this common approach, the Merida Initiative was born on October 22, 2007. It involves the transfer of technology, training, and equipment that will complement the institutional capabilities of the Mexican state. And uh, now I just, uh, and I understand that it's also funding this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, great project, so uh, I am very happy to hear that. The Merida Initiative has contributed greatly to the strengthening of our investigative police, the modernization of the federal penitentiary system, and the deepening of drug prevention campaigns, all of these while upholding the standards of human rights. The systematic and sustained law enforcement campaign launched by the government of Mexico has seriously dented drug trafficking organizations and its illegal operations, yet it has also made evident the need to address challenges such as the trafficking of weapons from the United States into, into Mexico. That is providing VTOs operating on both sides of the border with substantial firepower. The overwhelming majority of the weapons seized from drug traffickers in Mexico have entered out our country illegally from the United States as demonstrated with relevant seizures along the Mexican border with the United States. 90% of all weapons seized in Mexico and, success, and successfully traced by ATF originated in the U.S. On the Arizona and Texas borders alone, there are more than 7,000 federal firearms licensed dealers and countless gun shows. Many of the weapons that are smuggled into Mexico are being bought by the drug syndicates either directly or through start straw purchases from these gun shops and gun shows. Now, what can the United States do in this regard to help Mexico? Among other actions, it can reinforce relevant U.S. agencies such as the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Customs and Border Protection so they have sufficient resources to in interdict southbound weapons on the U.S. side of our common border and to investigate, identify, and detain individuals that are bundling weapons from gun shows so as to introduce them illegally into Mexico. The Mexican government recognizes the steps taken by the administration of President Obama to enhance the capabilities of these organizations by significantly increasing the financial and human resources at their disposal and strengthening actions against arms trafficking at the border. It is estimated that criminal organizations generate revenue of between 19 and 25 billion dollars from the sale of illicit drugs in the United States. Out of these, only 460 million dollars are seized. That is a lot of money, but clearly there is more than can be done. In this di direction, the Department of Justice has provided training to Mexican counterparts to bring them up to speed on the most innovative investigative tools to track laundered money. There has also been a steady increase in the amount of information between the U.S. and Mexican law enforcement agencies. 
Also, recent legislation has been passed by Congress in Mexico that will better detect money laundering transactions, create better banking regulation, and will better utilize customs intelligence with the stated purposes of preventing criminal organizations from using their gains and taking to court relevant money laundering and terrorism financing cases. I want to end by emphasizing that the common actions that the United States and Mexico are taking on together reaffirms our mutual com compromise with the security and well-being of our people, so that in the future they can live free of the violent and corruptive nature of the drug trade. I look forward with interest to hearing the discussions that will come from all the panels and keynote speakers in the days to come, and I'm sure we will all be more enriched from this conference. Thank you very much. On behalf of Emory's Institute for Developing Nations, um, I'm very, very honored to welcome you to this conference. The Institute for Developing Nations is a partnership between the Carter Center and Emory University. Through our work, we seek to raise awareness about problems related to global poverty and inequality and to promote collaborative efforts to address those problems. It's in this spirit that I welcome you here today. Understanding rule of law and finding ways to strengthen it are of particular interest to the Institute. This interest grows out of one of the projects, um, one of our early projects that we did together with the Carter Center. As some of you know, the Carter Center's democracy program has a long established record of election monitoring and more recently they've extended their democracy building work uh, to, to uh, programs that strengthen rule of law, particularly in Liberia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. After nearly 14 years of civil war, rule of law in the West African country of Liberia is fragile at best. In 2008, the Carter Center asked for our help in understanding gender-based violence, an issue that broadly engages efforts to strengthen rule of law. Drawing on the resources of legal scholars, historians, anthropologists, women's studies scholars, political scientists, and NGOs, as well as government officials and community groups, we were able to offer some short-term recommendations to the Carter Center, and I think uh, also able to kindle the passion of some of our colleagues um, from a number of fields to work on rule of law development. Although the circumstances that have brought about the need to strengthen rule of law in Mexico are very different than those in Liberia, the overall issues are the same. The degree to which there is political will and institutional capacity to ensure accountable government, the capacity of the state to protect and deliver the rights of citizens, and the state's ability to enforce the law and provide security to its citizens. Without these things, it's impossible to secure legitimacy for governance and effective state building. Both are necessary prerequisites for building and sustaining democratic societies. Again, it is an honor to have you here. I thank you for your work on rule of law in what I know are some very challenging um, circumstances and for your willingness to be part of conversations that will take place over the next three days. Thank you. All right, I have to try a little. Bienvenidos, mis amigos. Uh, bienvenidos a la conferencia. Um, that's about as far as I can go. But welcome very much, my friends, to this conference. It is really an honor to uh, be with you and to see some of the ideas that have been percolating here for the last couple of years come together. And let me tell you about some of the history of what brings us here. One of the things that I want to do is to say a special word of thanks to this young man who stood up from, in front of us right at the beginning, Alex Barney, and tell you just a word about him. He is a remarkable young man. He, is a young, he was a young uh, law student here a number of years ago now. Uh, and then a grad fellow in our Center for Advocacy and Dispute Resolution. And I can say to you that if he hadn't knocked on the door and said to me, Professor Zwier, what are we going to do about? And he had a number of things that he wanted to do uh, that I know that my enthusiasm and my involvement in these projects wouldn't have come about. So 
it's really a, a tremendous uh, a sense for me of gratitude. He's brought new meaning into a lot of my work that I want to thank Alex uh, Barney for his work. And as you know, those of you that have met with him and worked with him, that his work in Mexico City and uh, at the Universidad Panamericana has really been just outstanding. Uh, I think in my work in rule of law over the last 30 years, I have never seen so many folks come together so quickly, and I have to say I think a great deal of that has to do with Alex's work. So if you would, would you help me in thanking him for his work? Now, early on, what, what happened is for us, on our side of, uh, of uh, this CHI's partnership with uh, Universidad Panamericana, is that from our side of it, we were very interested in seeing whether what uh, Dr. Nielsen uh, has, Renshaw Nielsen has suggested, is that were there rule of law best practices that might apply in different settings. And one of the, the experiences that I had had as a young National Institute for Trial Advocacy trainer in a variety of settings was to see an interesting thing happen when I engaged with folks, lawyers and judges coming together to do advocacy training. That one of the things that was quite remarkable to me is that in coming together as professionals to talk about advocacy, what might develop in the way of conversations and camaraderie and community that perhaps also helps shape folks' ideas and attitudes towards the rule of law and the process of resolving disputes. And from that really anecdotal experience in coming together and doing some of that training, have been involved in doing ju both judicial education and lawyer education, then in a variety of settings, including in Northern Ireland with uh, Catholic and Protestant lawyers, in Africa and, and a number of different countries, in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, and, uh, and it was out of some of that work that Alex and I sat down and said, how about what, what might we be able to do in Mexico? And of course, USAID and HED at that point was soliciting uh, requests for proposals, and it was from that that, in fact, uh, we started our, our um, project to try to build a relationship in rule of law development in Mexico. Dean Lozano, let me thank you very much for your wonderful, warm remarks at the beginning and also for your thoughtful uh, remarks about the Rule of Law Project and about the, the way that rule of law is being thought about. We have in our early experiences in our attempts to work in, uh, in, uh, at, with the University of uh, Universidad Panamericana in Mexico City realized that we have some language issues uh, about what we mean by various fundamental um, concepts like rights, even uh, what's your theory of the Constitution, about law, about private property ownership, that have already created some interesting conversations where I know Carlos Requena has said to me, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not connecting and we need to talk some more because before I can teach it, I'm not sure that I understand what the really what the issues are and I to him back have had some of the same kinds of conversations and so this has been this wonderful I hope what ties envisioned education on on both sides about the challenges of developing rule of law and oral adversarial systems in in Mexico uh, what does it mean what is oral adversarial what's an oral adversarial system going to mean how much of the Mexican traditional legal system is going to be maintained, how much of it is going to change. Obviously, these are some of the big questions that we'll be talking about during this conference, at least on the rule of law side. Let me also say that the Institute for Developing Nations is just a terrific partner in this process because the Institute for Developing Nations says, you can't look at these just as lawyers. You're going to miss at least half, if not three quarters of the issues, the real issues, if you don't involve political scientists, if you don't involve anthropologists and historians, if you don't involve folks across the university to really talk with you about what's going on, to help you understand really what the current situation is, to understand its history, and then to really develop sensitive solutions to the problems. And, and so it's through that, that out of that uh, uh, really incentive that we, we have our conference 
as scheduled as we do to open up conversations, to have people present their ideas, and please let's challenge each other across our disciplines about what it is that we're doing so that we can learn together. That's the intent of this, of this conference. Let me also say that uh, we, we have folks here who have very wonderful ideas that they are going to challenge us with. Judge Gray in particular has a wonderful uh, uh, challenge to us about decriminalizing uh, the drug issues and whether or not in fact uh, that's, a, that's an idea that really is time has come and that we've got to fix our way of thinking about it. That will obviously be something that will be challenged by others who will have different experiences about that. I need to put in a quick plug for Judge Gray and his book. If you haven't seen it, he's got his books here up here and he will be grateful and sign, and sign a book for you if you'd like him to, but he is uh, here to help us and challenge us really at some of the foundational assumptions of what it is that we're, we're going to be talking about. Finally, if I can, let me just tell you that, that I am really very grateful to Emory University and its vision, its bigger vision, about what it is that we're about here. Uh, Emory University has supported this work, and it, it does so in many different ways. It involves the Carter Center in the work that the law school is doing. Uh, it tries to take a, 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 a look at the issues at the highest level, at the most ethical level. Uh, and I think Emory University brings in its prestige and its resources to these problems, and I'm very grateful that Emory is part of the project. So uh, with those introductory remarks, what I'd like to do is let's go ahead and let's uh, take a little recess, a little break here, and then we'll reconvene in Tall Auditorium for our first panel at 1.45. Okay? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you.